good pictures. And he made me takes two, and very rarely does anyone have their eyes closed. And I'm not sure why that is. <laughs> it's amazing. Because I can take a picture of three people, and one of them has to um, And for those of you who haven't been here before, but I think probably all of you have, but there's not using that. Uh, there's water and, and might be a little bit of wine left, I'm not sure. Uh, I brought an extra bottle. Oh, you brought, yeah. So there's, there's wine. plenty of wine. Um, and um, if it gets too hot or too cold or something, let us know. You know, just come and talk to me and adjust the And I want to applaud uh, and Dave, Shamal, maybe you can pass this on to Susan. They redid our floors. So I don't think we'll slip and fall. <laughs> Although when I was at yoga after that, it was a little tricky. But, um, but you know, we appreciate everything that both the hall does as far as making this space available to us and also the parking, uh, we're under the Parking and Recreation Association for Costa Canyon and we appreciate their support too. So, Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, 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 it's coming up. India launched a lunar probe. It's in route. It just went into a new kind of orbit. Um, after all the... Well, here, let me read my notes. That's why I wrote them. Launched in July 22nd, 2019. Uh, it's made five uh, orbit uh, maneuvers uh, coming, swinging back around toward the Earth and then moving out. It's August 20th, it will go on to uh, approach the moon, and on September 2nd, it will, uh, basically what's going on here, so this is just really cool. This is from the Indian Space Research Organization. This is their first attempt to land on the moon with a lander and rover. They have a, it's really a multiple mission, it's an orbiter, lander that, that uh, will let loose a little rover uh, toward the south pole of the moon. So all this is coming up in the next uh, few weeks. Keep an eye on this, this is a big story for them and for everybody about science, but this is the lander that, uh, you know, packaging this stuff up, this is the little rover that comes out. Of it. So it's, it's pretty exciting. This is going to be their attempt at landing on the moon with a robotic spacecraft. Um, the ultimate goal is September 7th. I mean, that's when uh, the lander uh, will uh, fire its engines and, and, and head for the moon surface. And then uh, once it's safe and sound, it will unleash the rover. So this is a big deal. Uh, there are among multiple countries now that have, uh, including China, uh, capability of landing on the moon and doing, you know, landers and and maybe even human exploration of the moon in the future. This is sort of a new blueprint I found, and it wasn't done by anybody but their space agency, which is kind of showing where they think they're going to be going. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about, you know, are they going to the moon? Or humans? Or, uh, I don't know. It kind of says manned lunar landing and then set up a lunar base, so I don't know, I assume that's part of the program. Anyway, this is fairly new imagery on the right. This is their uh, Shangi-4 uh, far side. This is on the back side of the moon, the far side of the moon that we don't see. And they have a rover that's going to eighth or ninth lunar day now of operations. Pretty significant. And uh, it's doing its uh, research. Again, it's a robotic lander. Um, again, I, I know I tire you a little bit on China, but I really spent a lot of time on watching China. I think it's the real game changer here in the future. Um, 
and watch for their space station program that's evolving. They're going to do a lot more uh, human spaceflight uh, launches in the next uh, few years to help build their space station uh, that should be in place by sort of the 2020 time frame. Uh, I just downloaded these this morning. This is NASA's Curiosity Mars rover. Don't forget, it's been there since August of 2012. It's just, it's a nuclear-powered rover doing a really kind of fun, uh, exciting exploration of um, the Gale Crater where it landed in August of 2012. How many miles has it gone since August of 2012? 14 miles. <laughs> okay, but it's an important mileage. Uh, so look at these pictures, though, just this, this morning. This is some of the... Uh, Imagery that is returning. Great images. And it, it just in the last uh, week or so uh, had, I can't remember the number of times it's drilled into the uh, Martian surface, but it actually did another one, uh, collected samples, and it's going to be dumped into this part of the Curiosity rover to do an analysis of what, uh, what that material is made of. So it's doing pretty good since August of 2012, still cranking after all these years. Um, one thing to watch out for that nobody's going to pay attention to but me, um, <laughs> X-37B, this is a military Air Force space plane that I, I call it mysterious because it's classified Nobody knows what these things do. This is robotic. Uh, it's like a UAV for space, a, you know, an aerial vehicle, but it's in space. Uh, a friend of mine actually got a picture of this thing in orbit uh, not too uh, a week or so ago. What's his name? Uh, oh, what is his name? Ralph. Wow. Ralph Vandenberg. He's an astrophotographer. He does really interesting. Uh, imagery of satellites, and he has picked up the, uh, the X-37B space plane. Not a lot of detail there, but nobody knows what this thing does, but the key thing is it's going to break a record. It's coming up. If it stays up there, let me look at my notes again. I spent time on this, so I better read these. Um, okay, this is also the X-37B. This is the orbital test vehicle, OTV. Five uh, mission, and it was launched back in September 7th of 2017. The last and lengthiest Air Force mission of this kind of craft was 718 days of flight. And it came back and landed at the Kennedy <coughs> Space Center back in May of 2017. So next week on the Saturday or Sunday, this the one that's up there uh, may break the record for the longest a uh, mysterious space plane in Earth orbit. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what it's doing, but it's there it's, a, there. they it's seem like to be a, happy. Yeah, it's like a miniature shuttle. It's a mini show. And it tests classified payloads. Yeah. <clears throat> and this was the early photographs of, of the last landing mission at Kennedy Space Center for the first time. It comes in, uses GPS, kind of flies in, totally automatic. Uh, they drag it back into the hangar, they retrofit it, and they launch it again. And actually, what I didn't say, um, one thing to keep an eye on, there's apparently uh, another uh, one of these vehicles that's going to be launched in, what did I write? I think November, December time frame. So one wonders whether they're going to have two of these things up there at the same time. We'll see. Uh, Last thing is asteroid, asteroid Bennu. Um, it turns out that NASA's spacecraft has rendezvous with this thing, and it has a hard time trying to figure out where to uh, touch down and grab samples. Because guess what? There's rocks on the thing, and they're worried about the rocks. So they, they selected just the other day four landing site areas for this uh, NASA space probe to touch down on this asteroid and collect 
uh, potential samples. One of these sites will be selected next year, and they're going, going in for the gusto in something like July of next year. Is this Osiris Rex? This is Osiris Rex. This is built NASA. here. This was built in Colorado. This was built by Lockheed Martin. They're very happy. Another spacecraft that was, yeah, he, he worked with Lockheed Martin. This is why he's talking. I just, want, <laughs> I just want everybody to know. It's I know, it's important. It's from right down the road. I know, it's right down the road. The key thing, though, is this new sifter thing that they developed. It's pretty cool. I mean, I wrote a little story a long time ago uh, about the, the guy who designed it and his son went out to their driveway and created an air pump thing to show the management that they could actually suck up rocks off their driveway. And so that actually turned out to be one of the key designs that was used for this particular spacecraft, and it's kind of fun. Okay, this is not quite the guy's driveway, but it's a little <laughs> bit different. But you got four places now that they've done uh, pretty, you know, months and months of investigation of this asteroid to pick these places where they think uh, they can lower the spacecraft down and take samples back. And the cool thing is once they have the samples on board, uh, it'll, it'll happen in March of 2021. They want to depart the asteroid and arrive at Earth two and a half years later. So on September of 2023, um, whenever they collect uh, from the asteroid, we'll scream into Utah into a little capsule and then parachute and land on the Utah proving ground. So. Uh, We'll see how this goes. But I put that one point there, Leonard. It yeah. Does, it doesn't suck, it blows. Huh? It doesn't <laughs> suck, it blows. It blows. You okay. can't suck anything in space. So it actually directs a jet of gas down that pushes the material back up into the tube. There's no sucking sound. No, no sucking sound. Okay, it's okay. just all push. Yeah. So nobody so can hear you sucking space. Back into that right. Uh, Correct. It gets collected. How does it collect it? It's this is how it happened. Wins very clever design that, that yeah. they push air they push air down. The little plume shoots up into their nozzle. Their okay. Collection device. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's, it's no sucking. No sucking. Black sucks. Okay. 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 Um, I can't what was the one. diameter of those circles on that last picture? I, I, maybe Bob knows. What are the diameters of those landing site circles? Anybody know? Tens of meters, I think. Mean. <laughs> Tens of meters, meters always sounds good. Convert <laughs> 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 that into feet and then we're over. <laughs> Do you know about the explosions? Wasn't there a couple of them? One happened in Russia, and that did one happen in China. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh the, oh, the, oh, the nuclear cruise yeah, missile. Well, there was a nuclear yeah. missile that yeah. blew up. Cruise uh, missile. Killed, yeah. killed, killed the yeah. engineers. No. 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 <laughs> we, we, we I, I saw it go by. Yeah. Yeah. In the fifties and sixties. Yeah, we're on the verge of some really okay. entertaining <laughs> work of hypersonic missiles, and people are really gunning up for you know hyper velocity. <laughs> Major Delisol, <laughs> and uh, things blow off. You know, uh, seven engineers officially killed, um, and several more. Anything else? Killed. What else happened? Several days of what do you think happened in the last few months? <laughs> 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 you know, your book. Yeah, the lunar stuff. Oh, well, they put a lot of progress on this one. Yeah, that's what Bob's stuff is. And Leonard probably doesn't want me to say this, but. Probably the last hurrah of his moon book, which a lot of you were probably here, the moon rush, the next, the new space race. Uh, he's in September going to be at the Marshall Space Flight Center, and, and I'm, I'll be there with him, and we're gonna uh, talk talking there. to 900 people about his moon book. And unbelievably, this the group, the space club that's associated with the Marshall, NASA Marshall Space Center, you know. Ordered 900 books. Woo -hoo 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 -hoo.
because he's got to sign them all <laughs> a couple days before. And put so a he, he, on should he get like a, a carpal tunnel brace yeah. before he signs it? <laughs> <laughs> should he be practicing signing it? No. No. Some guy said, just, just put on Ben Gay and I've done everybody gets a purpose. No, it's not hey, Ben Gay. Hey, 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 yeah. Uh, Northrop Grumman was awarded a contract to build the habitat module for the yeah. Artemis yeah. 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 So that's yeah. now been kicked off. They're going to go build it. Yeah. The first one. Yeah, we're well, in a program mm -hmm. from NASA. You try to do this within a five year window. It's pretty much moving along. The other NASA can work with Congress and get the money to maintain that momentum. Mm -hmm. It's all in the TBD. <laughs> Nothing in NASA's past to suggest that this can happen. But, you know, I'm willing to be surprised. You know, I, I just, uh, you know, it doesn't matter about NASA to me. I, you know, it's, I, I would like to see them do the moon and, and be successful. But on the other hand, we got India ready to uh, land robots on the moon. we got China already there. There's a lot of countries that have an interest in moon exploration. So. The moon is not going to go uh, unexplored. Uh, maybe not with humans right away, but let's let's see if NASA can pull the program together and maintain the momentum. That they hope they can. Um, but it's uh, you know we're talking billions and billions of dollars, and we'll see how the public and the uh, you know political system really supports you know, future exploration of the moon. But meanwhile, there's a lot of stuff happening with outer planets. I'm going to a meeting next week uh, here in Boulder, and I think the next talk we'll talk a lot about uh, Europa and Enceladus and uh, Titan and the exciting promise of uh, finding life on these outer worlds. So uh, these people are coming together to try to define what experiments maybe some of these spacecraft may take down to the surface of these outer planet worlds. So it's uh, no lack of uh, exciting exploration, and so we'll, we'll certainly talk about that next program. So now, Bob? Yeah. Brim is up. Yeah. Bob and do a little you. thing about Bob. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want, before Bob comes up, I just want to say a couple other things. Uh, our next meeting will probably be five or six weeks from now. We haven't established for sure who's going to be the speaker, but um, right here. And uh, we probably, how many of you got the email about Denver Museum of Nature and Science and maybe going there? Not that many people, or maybe didn't see it. We were trying to see last, I think, two weeks ago, and we were trying to see it tomorrow. We could get their, they've got Apollo 11 and the Da Vinci exhibit, but uh, it's there for August 25th. I don't think we're going to try to coordinate something, although let me know if you're interested in going. I don't think Leonard and Leonard can go tomorrow, but um, anytime between now and August uh, 25th. Uh, the Da Vinci exhibit is really quite amazing. They've, uh, rebuilt, they're just replicas, but of what Da Vinci did, and have you seen it? Did you go there? This is a particular Anyway, um, so how many people have been there and seen it? Yeah, okay, me too. Yeah, and Leonard and I saw it just for a half hour or so. But it's really quite amazing. You have to sign up for the day and a certain time of day. And then the Apollo 11 movie, how many people have seen that? You haven't seen it? Okay, you can see it. And it's fantastic, and uh, from what we've heard, Leonard and I haven't seen it either, but you know, you can also get it on the, you know, through our TV accesses. See it in IMAX. So, but you say see it in IMAX, and it's 2D, not 3D. Yeah. Yeah. But, it's you know, got to be the sound, though. It's going to be Yeah, yeah. So it's worth it. But I think that's going to be there. The Paul uh, through uh, beyond August 25th, I think. So maybe we can coordinate something. We haven't done many field trips. Have we done any? You know, with our group? Uh, it's, it's easier to get you here than out there in October. Senate. Just want to mention uh, Mountain Messenger, they've always been very supportive of us. 
Uh, one of your gift shop has a number of the books that people have written, uh, her sky watches and other um, uh, artwork and all kinds of great stuff there. And uh, and if uh, if you haven't given a presentation, if you can give a five dollar donation, that helps us cover the ball and other expenses we have. Um, but if it's a problem, just come. And kids are always free. And it, if you bring your parents, some of you older people, then you're a kid and you're free. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, oh, it's strong parties, we hope to have one or two this summer, maybe at the Culpeper Canyon uh, K-3 school. We drove by there today. The soccer field looks like it's ready for us. Um, you know, and what's really cool about that, and we've only had about eight people at the ones we've done in the past, but you can bring a blanket or something, lay out on the soccer field, look at the stars, there's a, a great view there of the whole sky. We'll have telescopes. If you want wine, it's got to be off the soccer field because we don't want kids sticking to the soccer field. <laughs> They're very strict about that. You can have water and snacks and stuff and we have it before. So, and if we do that, we will give you like a day or two morning and we will all do this, um, or most of you have, because we can't predict a clear night sky and I don't want to just choose a date and then it's, you know, hot. It's guaranteed to be hot if you choose a date. If you choose a date, yeah. Anyway, so uh, our next speaker is Bob Grimm. And um, he works, or he's associated with um, the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder. And he's a geophysicist and a um, uh, Mars expert, Venus. And he's going to talk to us tonight about his uh, moon instrument that, is, that he just got funding for. Oh, okay. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, you know, I've been associated with Skywatchers uh, as long as I've been doing it. I try to talk about something that might be of interest to people every year. Uh, this this is a project um, that really goes back 20 years for me. And the size of this project is not huge. This is three million dollars to buy the same room and ten million dollars to operate it, you know, for like a week. And do all, do all the science. But there's there's several million dollars of prior money that went into that, plus you know, internal research that my company gave me to develop these things, plus all the science that you do to build your education to say, yes, I deserve to do this because I can tell you something useful out of this. So it's really a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, hopefully this is just the first of some related experiments that we'll be able to do uh, you know before I retire, which is like not all that long before the future. Uh, I'm, a little, I'm a cynic, if you don't know me, uh, and so I'm a little bit cynical about this moon program. The, there's the whole human program of the moon, which is which would be great. I don't think we can do it by 2024. That's what the that's what NASA's been told to do it by. Um, but that's what you know. That's what they're putting on a brave face and trying to do. In the meantime, they're trying to do this this commercial lunar program. And I'll tell you about that. But uh, it's kind of crazy. It's like the Wild West out there. And, and it's not, I mean, this, this is a rendering of one of the landers with our experiment on it, but this thing is going to be jammed to the gills with who knows what. Um, and, and so it's great that this thing's going to go to the moon, but you know, I don't know what's going to be in the payload bay next to our, uh, next to our experiment, because these guys want to make money sending stuff to the moon. Um, so let's talk, uh, first of all, is it the top button? Or are you it's it's the, button? it'll be the right button. Right, right button? Yes, sure. There you go. Okay. So what is Commercial Lunar Payload Services, they actually call this CLIPS. It started in December 2017 when the President issued Space Policy Directive 1, which among other things said we're going to go back to the moon, which meant canceling something that the previous administration was doing. We're going to go back to the moon and um, we're going to do it emphasizing public-private partnerships. So we want to make this a business opportunity to go to the moon to enhance the prestige of the United States to, uh, and, and, and to you know, go as one. Um, and uh, NASA followed that up uh, several months later with the announcement of the CLIPS program, where they, where they basically said, okay, companies out there, send us proposals for how you would land 10 kilograms, 20 some odd pounds on the moon. And that, that worked two things behind the scenes. Number one, it, they canceled something called Resource Prospector, 
which was an idea from just one NASA center to send a little rover to the poles, Leonard's talked about this, and look for, the, look for ice that we could mine and, and, uh, and astronauts could use that uh, at, a, at a polar base. Um, NASA canceled that. They didn't want this, this one NASA center, uh, you know, kind of touting its own, or flying its own flag. Um, and, and I sort of didn't support this one idea. Uh, but that went away. And then there was this thing called the Google Lunar X Prize, which you may have heard of the other X Prize, the Ansari X Prize, was, was won by, uh, what's the name of Rupert Tant's company? The, the Spaceship One. Spaceship One. They, they achieved the first uh, private suborbital space flight. So they went to 60 miles high or something. Uh, and now, and then. Uh, uh, Richard Branson basically bought it, and he's going to have Virgin Galactic and sell flights on it. But there was a prize of some amount of money, millions of dollars, that was put up with the first organization that could do this, and, and they succeeded. Then Google, it was just the, the flagship sponsor, said, okay, can somebody land on the moon and, and either through hopping or sitting on a little rover go 100 yards and, and take pictures? And for a decade, people tried to do this. They, there were many companies. It was about a dozen companies at first. It got down to about five. And they couldn't get it done, and so Google canceled the, the X Prize. But all these companies were still out there with their designs. So by NASA saying, all right, we will just buy payload. We, all we want is to, is to pay you money to send our stuff to the moon. And we're going to be minimally invasive. Usually when NASA, you know, if you're, if you're an experimenter and you want to propose an experiment, and NASA accepts it, there's many, many rules you have to follow. And in this case, we really don't know what the rules are. NASA pretty, said, pretty much said, make up your own rules. But we don't know if they're serious about that yet. Uh, so, so, but the idea is, the bus comes by, you get on the bus and, and go to the moon. That's what they're trying to, what they're trying to do here. Um, just last year, they, they selected nine companies as sort of what I call the stable, the barn full of companies that can possibly, that are allowed to bid on actually sending payloads to the moon. And then in May, they selected, um, well, that should have been three, sorry. It, 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 three of the nine, it says it. Three of the nine are given actual task orders to send um, stuff to the moon. And the flights are supposed to start in 2021. It's supposed to cost a million dollars a kilogram, which works out to about a thousand dollars, sorry, a thousand dollars per per gram, and a grams is, if something is sort of like this. So let me just pause here. What would you, if you had some thousands of dollars that you, and you wanted to send something to the moon, what would you want to send? <laughs> I got it. A radiometer. A radiometer, okay. Okay, I, I can tell you one thing that's going to be popular is ashes. Right? Pre, you know, you, 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 you know, pre ring grandpa said, said, said this much of it to the moon. And, and I'm sure they're going to have ways, well, even if it crashes, right, your, your grandpa's ashes are still on the moon. <laughs> you still made it. Um, but I'm sure they would have ways of like, taking pictures of the selfies of the spacecraft and, you know, here's your thing in the rack on the moon. And, you know, so, so that's why it's going to be crazy because, it, you know, NASA, again, NASA's just buying payload. Now, I think, I think they may want to buy, like, the whole payload, which would be great, because then the experimenters can say, well, you know, if there's something you know that's got like some sense of radio in the room, that might be bad. Um, but you know, having compatibility with payloads is important to the scientists. It's not so important for you to send ashes. Um, but you know, everybody's gonna have a chance to send something in the room if you want to. Um, here are what I found on the web of, of pictures of the of what the ideas for the nine providers are. Um, we think that Astrobotic is, is the best. They're, they've been, they seem to have, they, they were very outgoing in, in communicating with teams. Um, now contact's been cut off, now that we can detect. Uh, but uh, they, they seem to mostly have their act together. And of course, I, I, mean, I don't know who most of these are. Um, uh, Draper is a pretty well-known uh, organization affiliated with MIT. This is a small group here in Colorado. Uh, these guys are affiliated uh, well, I'll show you them in a minute. Uh, these guys are spin off of these guys, and they're still fighting. Uh, <laughs> these guys uh, is the you may have heard of the Israeli lander, the Beresheet lander oh, that crashed on the moon in 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 May. That's what this that this is going to be reborn as this. Because they're going to fix what they did wrong. Um, 
Aston Space, I've heard of them, but I don't know what they do. And then Lockheed, you know, that's what so builds all the big stuff. I don't know why. They, they want to be in every business, but they're gonna, they want to be in this business too. And that's a, that's a pretty good looking lander to me. Uh, so, uh, you know, I want to go on that one. Because, because I, you know, just my gut feeling is half of these are going to crash. They have, Martin has the most heritage with landers of any of those companies. They, well, uh, Viking, right? It's well, that's well, that's beyond Viking, the polar landers. That's right, it, that's right. And, uh, and, and Insight, Insight's the most recent one. Yeah, polar landers not the right one to do. Insight. Yeah. There's two of them. Uh, uh, so yeah, well, Phoenix, Phoenix, Phoenix. You know, Phoenix, Phoenix and, and Insight. Yeah. Both work, yeah. Yeah, so these presumably would be much, much smaller. But, but um, yeah, I mean, our team is going to be, we're already trying to think of how can we use our money as, as we build the first one, can we actually build the second one? And or at least have the parts lying around for a second one in case whatever they put us on crashes. And then we can, you know, maybe they'll feel bad for us, let's fly again, maybe not. But we want to be ready. We're, we're already have the idea that, that these things are going to crash in mind as we move forward. Hmm. Okay, so these are the first nine. So then NASA said, all right, oh, in the meantime, uh, they, they, they put out a call for proposal for, for, for payloads, okay? And this is from, uh, it's hard to read this, I just pulled it off of uh, the Wikipedia page for clips, which, which these are very, very nice short descriptions actually. Now, I'm not gonna impugn any of the, um, the payloads here. I don't, some of them look more exciting to me than others. But I can tell you for a fact that when, when I was at a meeting uh, in Washington, one of the NASA people said to me, we are so desperate for payloads, we will send rocks back to the moon. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so these proposals were based on like five written pages to NASA. And these were all from NASA centers. So I kind of griped about that. Like, well, why do the NASA centers get to go first? It's bureaucracy. It's because NASA can give money to itself faster than it can give money to me. Um, and, and so they picked these first 12 payloads. They're supposed to be basically stuff that was lying around that's, that's, that's a reflight. Um, so for example, this, there's just a magnetometer which has no real specific objectives, um, but uh, I'm on the team for that group uh, and it's going to be confident in what we want to do. Uh, so um, uh, these are the first 12 and then they had to say, okay, where are they going to, where are they going to go on? So NASA then let these nine companies bid, said, you know, these are 12 things, what would it, you know, take what you want, and what would it cost to get them to the moon? And so 12 companies, I don't know how many companies bid on it, but, but they picked three of them, and it, it was these first three. Um, so it's, it's astrobotic and computer machines, and it'll be on, here's scale models. Um, this is the, the, the uh, associate administrator, administrator uh, Thomas Rebuch, and he's in charge of all NASA science. He's a tall guy, he's not quite two meters, um, mm -hmm. but he's close. So this is probably good two meters tall uh, right here. Um, so this is like really high. And then you can just see part of the other one, the orbit beyond one. Okay, so that's great. Like let's let's line up, let's let's get ready to go to the moon. Then uh, just this July, orbit beyond pulled out. They just said, well we can't do it, let us out. And I said, okay, well the reason, you know, and you're gonna get some you know, all the numbers here in this meeting, um, is, is that the, the, the parent company for Orbit Beyond is, is called Team Indus. It's an Indian organization. And they were one of the XPRIZE contenders. That's their X, that's their XPRIZE land that they wanted to develop. But, but there was all this, this confusion about where is it going to be built? This is supposed to be a made in American program. This is the American clips. And, and in the Indian press, they would say, we're building this land to go to the moon. And in the American press, they would say, we're building a slander at Cape Canaveral. So maybe, the, maybe they'll sort this out in the future. For now, they said, we're just going to back off and, and, uh, and not do this. So whoever was on this, I don't know which payloads are on which lander, they got to find new rights. Okay? Then there's a legal protest against intuitive machines. Okay? So intuitive machines, I said, was the spinoff of Moon Express. Now, I don't know exactly if Moon Express is involved in this, but um, so this is a rumor because one of my colleagues knows somebody whose payload is on that. So it's only two people removed, right? That's a pretty good rumor. Um, and all they know is that there's a legal protest and then it, and it's supposed to be resolved in October, okay? If, it's, if, if they have to drop out as well, then all those people have to find a new ride as well. Now, 
In the meantime, NASA, in its wisdom, has issued a call for another set of landers. So they got this first set of nine. They haven't given them all jobs yet. Two of them are in trouble already. And now they're saying, well, we want more. We want more companies to bid. And they want something even bigger. Why? Because they want to carry a rover that can go look for ice, which is like what they want to do in the first place. <laughs> OK? So, so you know, the idea is they're opening it all up to, all, you know, to the commercial sector and not just having one you know, NASA group build it. So you know, again, I'm thrilled to be you know, in the mix here, but uh, we don't really know what's going on with this program. <laughs> <laughs> OK, here's the next 12 payloads. So these were bid from outside NASA. Um, I don't, you know, this is, this is much more competitive. Uh, I wrote the best proposal of my life to, to do this. I mean, really. And, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was, I think it's the best proposal of all these, all right? I'm just really excited about it. Uh, that's ours right there. This is the new word for tonight, Magneto to learn it. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, we have some partners, I'll show you them. Um, and and there, you know, there's very, I mean, a new camera, okay, great. Um, uh, but what I'm excited about is these two payloads from colleagues of mine, a retro reflector, which is where they bounce a laser off of the surface of the moon and measure very small motions of the moon to, to learn about the inside of the moon. This was done during Apollo. There's several of these things on the moon, but depending on where this lander goes, it could really help the network. So that's good, that's exciting for geophysics. And then uh, uh, Seiji Nagahara from Texas Tech, a longtime moon heat flow guy, uh, is going to do some kind of probe into the subsurface. They'll measure the heat flow of the moon, and that's very complimentary to what I want to do as well. So I've got to find a way to go with these guys. <laughs> um, OK, so what are we going to do? So first, let me tell you about what, but th th these are big questions about the moon that we want to try to answer with this little payload. Um, so the first thing is what's called the differentiation of the moon, this, the vertical segregation. So we know that the moon was basically extensively melted early in its history. And this is one of the most amazing stories in science to me, because this was known from the very first soil samples that came back from Apollo 11. Um, a guy named John Wood at Harvard, who was my advisor's advisor, so I guess he's sort of my academic grandfather. Uh, he, he, looked at, he looked at these soils and from the minerals that were in there, plagiarized. clays. Uh, he, he said, well, you know, this meant that the only way you can get this mineral here is if it floated to the surface of a giant sea of molten rock. And so the idea that the whole moon was, mul was melted early was known very early from Apollo. Part of that melting process means that it separated into its crust, the white stuff, uh, a mantle, which is shown in green here, and then the core of the moon is really pretty small at the bottom. But we don't know um, what the inside of the moon, what the layers inside of the moon look like. So if we could learn something about that, we'd know, is this, is this the configuration? This is, I'm actually showing you a cross-section from probably before everything turned upside down, because it, it was gravitationally unstable. So how the in, what the layering of the moon looks like will, will let us know how planets evolve uh, the moon is sort of being a basic in-member case of that. The other thing that I'm interested in about the moon is its asymmetry. Uh, and that's why I talked about the man and the moon uh, in the advertisement. So the, if you look at the top right, there's the dark parts of the moon and the light parts. The, the, the light parts are the early crust that floated to the top. The dark parts are lava that has filled in basins on the moon that were formed by giant uh, impacts. Um, and uh, why are all the dark parts of the moon kind of on one side of what we see? And there's hardly any on the far side of the moon. They're all, it's all concentrated. Um, and then in 1998, the Lunar Prospector spacecraft went there. It found that that same area, not, not, counting, not counting these out here, but, but all, everything over here, was, was rich in what's called incompatible elements. That's a terrible word to be incompatible, right? But, <laughs> but what it means is that there are many, many elements are, are bay atoms, or, or else their shape is such that they just don't fit into a crystallizing magma. So you start with molten rock, certain minerals come out of that first, and, and certain people, certain people, certain minerals get, and elements get left behind. They don't, they don't fit, they, it's like musical chairs. They, they cannot sit down, they cannot get into the mineral structure. And so they get left at the very end, the dregs. When the whole thing finally crystallizes, the, these leftovers are, are just left over either at the top or maybe in one part. And so the, the, it's, it's, it's phosphorus, 
uh, it's, it's potassium, uh, and it's these rare earth elements that Leonard has mentioned uh, uh, in his talks that don't fit. And so it's, it's called creep. Somebody, the petrologist invented this word creep. And the, and the, and the, and the region that it's in is in um, this, this is called Okeanus Procolarum. Uh, on the on the western side here, so it's called the Procolarum Creek terrain. So it it is the weird place on the moon, and and we don't know exactly how it formed. This idea that drags is get out there, and one of the big questions with it is is how did it affect the crust and the mantle right below? And is and and I published a theory of a model that said, well, I think it could be sort of cold underneath there because it formed this way. Somebody else did something and said, well, we think it's hot underneath there. So if we tell it's hot or cold mm -hmm. underneath there, we can like answer this question of, of how the man of the moon is mm -hmm. about. So speaking of the man of the moon, let's do a little interview. Um, you know, what people talk about the man of the moon, what what is the man of the moon? What do you guys see in here that's do you see a whole body? Do you see eyes? Do you see anything? <laughs> I, I already see the rabbit in the moon. Dragon up there. The rabbit. The rabbit. <laughs> to me, these are the rabbit ears. And that's the rabbit body, and I don't pay attention to that. <laughs> oh, that's the rest of the ant, though. Oh, okay. Well, I found this online. Um, they, they kind of just darkened in some places and, and called that the main movie. Um, and that reminds me then of this famous movie from the early 1900s, the first, mm -hmm. the first, the first uh, making of the, yeah. uh, <laughs> the Jules Verne uh, yeah. novel. And if you just do Man of the Moon on Wikipedia, you get this. Um, so, so yeah, there, there's the rabbit in the room with the whole ear. So yeah, that, that could have been the whole body. Um, I don't know if this is like Wilma Flintstone on the moon. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we can always uh, figure out some kind of things. We humans like to see faces. So what is it that, that, that I want to do? We want to look inside the moon. And, and, and so there's two steps to that. We want to find whether this parts of the moon are hot or cold when there's layering. And the way we, we're going to do that is by measuring its electrical conductivity. So electrical conductivity is a property how well something conducts electricity. Something like a metal, like copper, has very, very high electrical conductivity. That's why we use it in a lot of our wiring. Something like rock has a very low electrical conductivity. But, you, but it's still, it, it still will conduct some electricity. And that's important. Because we want to probe how well the inside of the moon conducts electricity with electromagnetics. So we're not going to hook up uh, electric current to the moon and try to see how well it does. But instead, we look at natural electromagnetic waves that are in the solar wind, that are in the uh, magneto tail of the Earth, and they are actually penetrating into the moon and into the Earth. And from the surface, we can measure the response and infer what it looks like at depth from that. So these are. This is just you know. A bunch of modeling that I oops that I did uh, that is this a laser? No, just point. Um, you know, if it's hot, it looks like this. If it's cold, it looks like this. This is electrical conductivity. But it gets hotter, it gets higher. Uh, and this is how well the, the envelope is. How well we think we can do with our with our instrument. Um, and so really, it doesn't kind of track anymore below about here. But that's okay because they're really different up here. And these are some examples from the Earth. Um, by setting up many stations uh, all, like all around Europe, or this is a profile uh, across Western Canada, you can see that there's different structures in the subsurface that have been, uh, that have been resolved. And uh, I like this picture of Europe because this, this is a big uh, suture zone with plate tectonics where the, this whole part of Europe and this part joined together and they're different in the subsurface. But this is about the size of the near side of the moon. Um, so it's, it's a, that's, that's, that's the kind of size of thing we're looking at. Okay, um, so what we do is something called the magnetotoric method, and, and it's a big word, but it basically involves measuring the electric and the magnetic field and figuring out what the resistance uh, is. And, and normally on Earth you do this by laying out uh, a very long set of wires uh, with, with probes in the ground. So this is like your voltmeter at home. When you, you put it on a circuit or on a battery, you want to see what's happening across that battery. We're putting it across 100 meters of the ground and looking at how the waves are interacting with the ground. And you also uh, put magnetometers out for measuring the magnetic field. And for anybody who remembers Ohm's law, this is basically a version of Ohm's law, where the electric field, the voltage 
The voltage drop is, what is, is how we measure the electric field. And the magnetic field is actually telling us information about the currents that are flowing in there. That's the telluric part, currents. And so we can solve for resistance. And then the magic thing is that, that the, the lower frequency a wave is, the slower it, it, it oscillates, the deeper it goes into the, into the Earth. So we can measure a spectrum of, of electric and magnetic fields, get resistance, and then, and then we can make a profile uh, of what's going on in the Earth below that. And so that's what we hope to do for the moon. Now, this is a huge setup. I mean, here I am digging a hole in Oklahoma. I can't do that on the moon. That's just said me, right? Uh, uh, and uh, you know, here's a, this, this is not my experiment. But it's, this is just a nice picture. This is a big jug of water to put on there. And they've got all kinds of stuff. You know, we can't do this on the moon. So we got to build something very small. And, and how can we get away with that? Because it turns out the signals are very strong. The noise is, there's, there's nobody's, nobody's running power lines or radios on the moon. We, have a, we, just, we just sit there with one measurement for a week if we have to. And then what we have to learn is not the same as understanding those oil deposits because you know, people, have, you know, people depend on a lot of money to, to, to do experiments to, to find oil and gas or minerals. Whereas you know, we're just on the moon and it's inside of it. Um, so we can build a very small experiment. And so it you know, hasn't been built yet like this, but this is our CAD diagram, so it's about this big. Uh, uh, because, because this has to just be given to these lander people, it has to just be one thing. So, so you know, we're going to put it on one base plate. We want it to just sit on somebody's deck. This is really perfect for us, this one. Um, and so it's got, so this is what the electronics are in here. And then it's got two parts. It's got a mast. This goes up, that's the magnetometer, and we want the mass to get it as far away from the land as we can, uh, maybe five or 10 feet, just so that, oh, whatever the noise is going on inside the land, we're just that much farther away from it. Very common practice. What's really new here, and my colleagues, uh, Greg Delore is the guy behind us, we've been working together for almost 20 years on this, is in, in, in his engineer, Paul Turin, came up with this launcher design. So we're at, you know, we can't walk out with a spool and put this thing in the ground. We're gonna shoot them out with a spring. And, uh, and so there's three of these. These little green pills get shot out and they're gonna land, you know, uh, well, I got the meters here, so that's 30 or 40 feet. It's, it's, gotta, go, it's gotta go back to the kitchen, basically. So the point, there's only one sixth of gravity on the moon. So it's, you know, they built, they built prototypes, they tested it. And, uh, and so, you know, when, when those shoot out, they land the ground, and we make the measurements in the moon. Um, this didn't come out of, you know, like I said, $3 million is not a lot of money. Uh, uh, but we have these prototypes, two programs that are coming ahead of this, that are based on the Europa lander, okay? And uh, these are programs that are supposed to develop instruments for landing on Europa. Unfortunately, we're not going to land on Europa. Um, that's been canceled. It was never a real program. It was this one guy, Congressman Culberson, who was the Europa nut. He wanted to find the whales on Europa. Uh, and, uh, he kept pushing this. And they kept giving money to NASA, so NASA gave us money. Uh, so we're getting to develop our instrument. It's great, but um, uh, you know it, it's it's not going to work. These are just a couple of pictures of what the pieces look like. There's electronics, not so interesting, but you guys, people are really hard on this. This is the actual little magnetometer that goes on top of the mast. This is this is the, the electrical circuit that goes inside the little green pill. That, that shoots out of the launcher. There's a little built prototype of the launcher. This is how they tested the launcher. You put it in what's called a thermal vacuum chamber. Um, so you pump it down to a vacuum and you make it very cold. This was tested at like 85 Kelvin, the temperature in Europa. And this is just a little catcher that they shot it into and, and it's out there somewhere. They did the same thing with the mast. They, they deployed it, um, but on a slider. So we have all these pieces that we're gonna rebuild all for the for the actual lunar instrument. Okay, so CLIPS is the commercial lunar program. It's supposed to be an on ramp for instruments to the moon. Uh, it was described to us as the bus route, and we'll be waiting for the bus with Grandpa's ashes and whatever else we're doing on the moon. Um, we we hope to fly in 2022, um, and uh, and we, we hope to learn a lot about the inside of the moon. And we also hope then to propose after that for lunar geophysical network which would include things like seismometers. This would be very much like the InSight mission uh, to, uh, to Mars, except uh, several landers to the moon, and including uh, the magnetic experiment, which is not on, on InSight. So 
thank you all for coming tonight, and hopefully in a couple of years, we'll be able to revisit this together uh, with a successful end. So what is launching anything to the moon? Falcon 9s. That, that, that's, you know, they're, they're down to like 55 million piece, I think. And so I think the, the Eclipse providers are buying the Falcon launch and, and loading, you know, and maybe they're secondary, I don't know. But uh, uh, it, it, that's what I've heard is Falcons. Is the bus going to have uh, ion propulsion? Yeah. Um, you know, everybody's going to loot on this new Ruby trajectory. There's no more three-day Apollo. That's what I mean, yeah. So, so they start, you know, you, you just work your way out until you, then you get caught by the moon and you work your way down. And so it's like, it's a month long bus ride uh, for three months now instead of three days. So how, how, how do you land? They land. I don't, I just go along for a ride. <laughs> no. I mean, is it, is it jets or? It's all, yeah, it's all compulsive landings. Uh, apparently the parachute lander um, had some kind of guidance Turbo guidance problem, so it was a computer failure uh, about why it crashed. Uh, and that's when they had the tardy grades on it, the water bears. Um, so they're still sitting there desiccated on the moon when you thought it. But yeah, I mean, every, every one of those things has a big you know, rocket engine on the bottom of it. And, and, uh, and you just stop and drop. <laughs> when you shoot the pills out, how do you keep them from like, kind of bouncing back in? So, so we shoot them one at a time, um, and, uh, and there's plenty of slack in the line. So that it, and, and it's, it's sort of a super slow, like that. It's a super slow moment. Feel lucky, feel lucky today. Um, uh, yeah, they, I mean, they, they, the, the, they just, I mean, if they, they won't recoil, that's for sure. If, if, they, if they bounce and flop and whatever, we don't care. Uh, all they gotta do is be on the ground, and then we just take a picture to know where they are to reconstruct the geometry. They so don't even penetrate them. They're not spent right now. They're they're capacitively coupled. Not they're not galvanically coupled. One one thing that's happening is still DVD, and that's Jeff Bezos with his blue moon lander, which is pretty big compared to these other ones. And he he may be you know in the, in the end here. He's got the money to put into this thing, so. He sure is a wild card, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's a wild, wild card in this. So this is the Amazon.com guy with uh, a lot of money. So uh, All it takes is for him to spend one of his 50 billion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go do it. Oh, <laughs> Should we be shopping at Whole Foods yeah. or not? <laughs> so that's, that's a money. Yeah, right. George? How do you uh, eject your projectiles, you use a spring or do you use compressed air? Or we, we've looked at both. Um, uh, we think that in the long run that for like for the outer solar system, like Europa, that compressed gas would be better. And, and there's, and you could just heat, heat it up to a burst disk, which is like the most fail safe way. But for this project, for the low cost, a spring is fine. And it uses a thing called a frangible, uh, which is a, 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 it's not really a pyrotechnic. It's just, it's, it's this retaining device. You can put a lot of current through it, it breaks. So when, once that fringe bolt breaks, releases the spring and stuff goes out. Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 It's such a thrill to have our own local people here who It's going to be great in presence. You know, we've done, been doing this for five years. How many people have been here coming here for three years? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and I must thank Tom, uh, who is, uh, runs the Cub Scouts, because he gave us uh, some more free popcorn. Um, <laughs> and it works with my air popper, and it's great, you know. So I just want to thank you. I also wanted to just say, um, Thank you to Carolyn Collins Peterson who posts on our Facebook. Uh, you know, so if you, I don't know how many people, I have a big problem with Facebook because everything on there looks interesting. I only really have a few friends. And, um, but she posts, and so if you ever need to know the next meeting or whatever, she's doing that. A website too, but it's uh, got an issue right now, right? 
I'm working on it. No, I told you, don't work on it. Okay, good. I'll have that back up. And then on so our next speaker is Dewey Anderson, and he's an astrophysicist. So we've got an astrogeologist, an astrophysicist. And uh, he's got a whole lot of really interesting things here for after his talk. Um, and you can try on this helmet. And uh, hey, Dave. Dave, Dave Shummel. If some people want to put on the helmet, Afterwards, or you take that special picture? Sure. Or, you know, you all have our mm -hmm. <laughs> So, um, uh, without further ado, although I do want to know, this is a there is for what's, what's this? That, you'll know that. You'll know. Oh, you're you're going to It's going to take a, take a second to get all the show and tell stuff. Yeah, yeah. After. So we'll take a brief break. You can stand, spread, create the bathroom run, and then we'll start. Okay. Sometimes two months, sometimes they're international crews. There's six or seven people that usually go. I'll be covering all that. Oh, oh you will. Okay, I better stop. Okay, I just, this is one of my favorite projects. You know, so, turn it over to you. Okay, but what's kind of interesting is Bob just gave a talk about present and future real science and stuff. And now I'm going to talk about 20 year old pretend science. <laughs> so, uh, the last meeting, as Barb mentioned, Robin Zubrin was here. Um, I missed that talk because I was at, attending Apollo Palooza at the Aerospace Museum in Denver. But I assume he at least mentioned the Mars Society. He did. Ring a bell? Okay. Um, so what I want to focus on, they do a number of things, but I want to focus on one of the main uh, things that are involved in, which are these simulated Mars missions. Um, that they do in the Canadian Arctic and the Utah desert. Um, I was involved, as Barb mentioned, with the construction of these spacesuits, which is what all this stuff has to do with. Um, and so I'll kind of be focusing on that. But, as Barb mentioned, this is me, so what are the equations that are going to be involved in this project? Sorry, there aren't any. Oops. There aren't any. Um, yeah. This guy, um, put your calculators away. You can save it for my special relativity talk and I want to get around to doing more of those. So what I do want to do is give a little background on the Mars Society here. It really came from what I would call the response to the response that Robert Zubrin got in his book in 1996, The Case for Mars. He kind of put forth how we could do it, why we should do it, and the cool thing about it was that it was full of all kinds of technical details. You look at it, you're, wow, this guy's not just blowing smoke. There's math, there's a result of mathematical equations there, calculations he's done. So it was really serious stuff. And so he published the book, people read it, and they thought, wow, with all these details, this looks like we could really do this. And then they started thinking, okay, if we can really do this, how do we make it so that we really do this? And so Zirkin gets a lot of letters saying, how do we make this happen? He goes, I ought to organize these people. And so he creates the Mars Society. And so that's how that came into being. 
Um, now, from the beginning, he was very intent that the Marx Society was going to do something and not just be publishing a monthly newsletter that people would get saying, well, we should go to Marx. Um, so the question is, what can a bunch of citizens do to help get us to Marx? Can't exactly launch our own project. Well, at this time, late 90s, NASA had a project going on at uh, Hutton Crater up on Devon Island, which is north of the Arctic Circle. And what they were doing, so there's, there's Hutton Crater. It's an impact crater, 20 million years old, 14 miles in diameter. And what they were doing was trying out some of the scientific measurement, the experiments, the kind of stuff that they might do on a Mars mission. Um, but they weren't doing full mission simulations. And that seemed like something. Maybe the Mars Society could do that. So if we could build a habitat module, like you might actually land on Mars, then scientists could work out of that and be doing things in a way much more like what they would do if they were actually on Mars, doing a Mars mission. So, they can, they can bring their instruments and their, the things they want to work with and work in that environment. Um, and also, you could work on the logistics of doing a Mars mission. How do mission control interact with the guys on Mars? So the best place for the Mars Society to do this, of course, would be back at Houghton Crater, because the terrain there is very Mars-like. Um, and also, because of the Houghton Mars project, NASA had infrastructure up there. They had a little airstrip where you could have these twin other aircraft come in with supplies and unload them. So it seemed like a good thing to do. Now, one of the nice things about this, if you um, do a project up in the Canadian Arctic, is now you have an acronym at the ready. It's the Mars Arctic Research Station. <laughs> Mars. Um, but of course, doing that uh, sort of thing, Zubin realizes actually a little bit beyond what the general public uh, membership can afford to do, so he went looking for corporate sponsors. And he found there's a software company called Flashline Incorporated. And he went to them and they said, sure, and they would put up a bunch of the money for this thing, provided they named the thing the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station. Deal. We'll do that. Get a bunch of money for it. And also, it turns out that now you can talk about FMARS. And nobody thinks you're talking about the planet. <laughs> so it's kind, of, kind of handy to get a sponsor to put their name in front of it. Well, then the other thing he did is he went to the Discovery Channel and he said, would this be a really cool special TV episode? And we'll give you exclusive rights to the first simulated missions we do. And we'll put your name on the outside of the thing and all of that. And the Discovery Channel said, OK. So they created a TV show. Uh, special called Surviving Mars. It was all about the first season uh, of F Mars. What year is this, dude? 2000. Okay. Um, so then we got a bunch of other sponsors there to get their uh, names stuck on the outside. Now that you've got the money, the next question is uh, how do you design the thing? So the basic idea was. What's the largest thing you could land on Mars? And they, and they basically looked at what was the largest payload fairing available at the time. And it's 28 foot diameter. So you go, OK, let's make a 28 foot diameter cylindrical habitat module. We'll put sleeping quarters upstairs. It'll be two stories, two floors. Sleeping quarters, meeting area. Go downstairs, there's a lab area, bathroom and shower, and then airlocks. Because in a real Mars mission, you can have to put on spacesuits and go through airlocks to go outside. So, um, and then the other thing is, Discovery Channel wants us to look good. We want it to look kind of, quote, realistic. So they put landing legs on it to make it look like it hit landing there. Um, so my involvement was, got around the year 2000, um, Robert Zubin, as you made, if you were at the last meeting, He's local. He's got a company called Pioneer Astronautics in Lakewood. And I had heard, and I don't remember how I heard. I heard all of the Mars Society stuff, but I heard that there was going to be a meeting at Pioneer Astronautics to talk about the construction of this thing. So I went to that meeting. And at that meeting, Zurbin put out a call for volunteers to help. Now, the basic shell 
here is actually was actually being made at a fiberglass company in Commerce City. And so the basic idea was they were making uh, 12 wall panels. You can see the seam here between the wall panels. And then they also made the floor decking. And then they made the roof panels, which are kind of, you know, pie-shaped wedges. Excuse me, with a bit of an arc to them, so they've got kind of a domed roof up there. Um, so the interior walls, simple, cheap, two by four frames, plywood, paint and white. That would be good enough. The thing that impressed me was how do you get this big heavy stuff up there, not going to fit on a twin outer aircraft? So they contacted the US Marines and got them to do parachute drops from a cargo plane. <laughs> now, the way the Marines looked at it is hey, this is great training for our guys to learn about dropping big heavy things out of the parachute stuff. And we've never done a mission this far north before. I don't know why that matters, but it helped them talk themselves into saying, yes, let's go farther north than we've ever been before and do the parachute drops. Uh, so here's a picture. Uh, these horrible images were taken from a VHS copy of the Discovery Channel show, which is why it looks so bad. But that's the pallet coming out the back, and that's the parachute beginning to deploy. And then there you see the parachute kind of coming out. Now that, that pallet there, that's got like, the, the wedges of a wall on it. So that's a tall thing there. That's two stories tall. Like so all of it in one drop? Uh, I think they did multiple drops. They didn't put all 12 on one. Uh, but, you know, that's a stack of several of them. So that's a pretty big uh, load they're dropping there. Um, now this all had to be on a fairly tight schedule because A, we need to get the construction started early enough in the season up there that it's finished before winter sets in. And we really like to do our first simulated missions uh, before winter sets in. And of course, once we pick a date, the Marines have their own schedule to keep. So there's a date, and this is one we're sending our C-130s up there, so you better have your stuff ready. As it happened, fiberglass factory running a little behind. Mm -hmm. And so at that meeting that I went to, Zerbin puts out the word, hey, anybody, please, if you can, go to the fiberglass factory and help in whatever way you can. Well, I just finished a software consulting job with the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Didn't have another job lined up, so I had time on my hands. So I was able to go down there and spend a couple weeks stuffing fiberglass insulation into the roof panels and making a little door latch for the airlocks and then helping with a trial assembly of the thing at the factory. Uh, so there I am. These are two of the wall panels been fastened together. I'm on a little bali rolling underneath it, making sure all the bolts and stuff lined up so we can assemble the thing. That's after the you've got a part way of the trial assembly, standing there by the airlock. Uh, you can see they're putting the decals on for the sponsors. Um, yeah, in the foreground, see this blue stuff? Actually, you kind of really see it running out there. That's a crane system that can be assembled on site so that you can actually get there by hand, put together this crane system, and use that to raise the walls up into place. And then once that's the cylinder's done, raise the roof panels up into place. And that's how you can get that whole thing built. <coughs> by using this uh, crane system that you can assemble on site. Um, okay, so eventually we got it, uh, all the stuff done. We got it loaded up one grizzly night onto the trucks out there in Commerce City and shipped off to California, where the Marines loaded up into their C-130s and took it up to Devon Island. I was not involved with the assembly up at Devon Island. I am glad I was not involved with the assembly up at Devon Island. <laughs> There was a mishap. The last pallet coming up, all the other pallets have landed fine, everything's perfect, great. The last one, there's the pallet, there's the limp parachute no longer connected to the pallet. Shoom! Smashes into the ground, and that's what we had. So that's mostly floor panels and the crane. Look how bent up the crane pieces were. 
Oh. Like you get a, that's that's big, tough, hard steel there, guys. And they got mad. So suddenly we're like, how are we going to do this? It looks like it might have to, the construction might just have to be postponed for another year. Who knows? Well, there was a uh, Mars Society member, Frank Schubert, who had a construction uh, contracting company. And he is in construction stuff. He goes, I can figure out a way we can do this. So he came up to help. And he came up with a way which, quite frankly, was kind of dangerous. And the original architect, Kirk Michaels, he's the guy who designed the hab, was up there to help build the thing with a crane, basically said, I'm not going to be involved with this anymore. He left. Because he said, I think that's too dangerous. And I don't blame him for doing that. But I also said, I understand Robert Zucco's point. We've got to make this happen somehow. And if we got one guy here who says he thinks he can figure it out, well, then we'll do that. And so here they are, raising the first wall panels into place. They got guys on guy wires off to the side to hold things up. And what they did initially here, they got scaffolding. And they put those two, this is two wall pieces, they put them together. And then by hand, they got it up onto the scaffolding. <laughs> and then by hand, they lifted it up a little and, and moved these boards in there to hold it up. And now it's high enough that the winch from the crane that did survive can be used to crank the thing up to vertical. So there's the first one up in place. <laughs> so you can see that what they really did after they put those two wall pieces together, they then attached a leg to it and then raised it up from there. And still, you've got guys on guy wires. Um, so here they are with about half of them up. They're scaffolding those guy wires all over this place. Now they're doing wall, wall panels, a single one at a time. Getting close, almost there, and then the last wall panel. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> There's this gap between the walls. But they actually knew that that might happen, so they had a device called a come along. Yeah. I've never heard of that. <laughs> that strap goes all the way around the head, and it's got a hand crank on it, so the guys just crank it, just a little bit of time to bring it in until, boom, look at that. They're getting it finally sealed in. So they actually got the thing with the come along all cinched up so that they could put the bolts in. And they had that. Now, OK, the side's done. Now they need to do the roof. There's no crane to lower the roof pieces into place. So what did they do? They build the second floor, but they build it with a gap in it. And now they've got to see this little pulley system for the crane. By hand, they're raising the roof pieces up onto the second floor. And then, with scaffolding, by hand, they raise the roof pieces up. And you can see this guy, he's using his back to hold the thing up so they can get it fastened. It was kind of a central circular disc that all the roof pieces connected to. Are you doing? Yeah. At least it wasn't at 15,000 feet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they did get it finished that way. They got the outside done. Um, so now, with the outside done, they're going to actually start working inside. And now, you could look out at the environment around you through spaceship-like portholes and really begin to feel like, hey, they were on Mars. So this is a picture here. This is, wow, that really doesn't come through, does it? That's Robert Zubrin, and that's uh, Pascal Lee. Pascal Lee was a NASA guy involved with the Howard Mars Project. And of course, Zubrin, you know, from the Mars Society. And they're clearly discussing how are we going to finish out the interior, what are we going to do there. Well, this time, we had kind of a mission control on Pioneer Astronautics. That's where I was. They sent this picture down, so I sent it back. <laughs> <laughs> they actually have polar bears up there. So uh, yeah, it was one of those nervous jokes <laughs> about what it's like. Um, OK, so. Hey, with that, it's done. What now? We're ready to start thinking about doing missions. Well, before that, we had to work out some details about what this is going to be like. So we had to kind of plan what these mission simulations would be like. So there were two aspects we needed to work out. One was mission control. How's that going to work? 
Well, we've got an issue with communications delay with Mars, which is it's at least a four minute one way trip for a radio signal to get from Earth to Mars. If Mars is on the other side of the sun, we're talking more like 20 minutes. So we thought, okay, you can't have conversations that way, but hey, email. Um, that's a paradigm that you're used to working that's asynchronous. You send out your thing and you wait and you know, sometime later you'll get a response. We would put a time stamp on the email so they would know when we sent it and then they'd know how long they had to twiddle their thumbs before they could actually open it and see what we said in order to match the time delay. One of the things that meant was they had to send up some communications people. And I think that's the Houghton Mars Project might have been involved with this as well. To set up a satellite internet connection up there on Devon Island, so they would have internet. And then all that means mission control is, at Pioneer Astronautics, we're one room at Pioneer Astronautics, a couple guys sitting at computers on the internet. And that's our mission control. Um, so, all right, so now we want to, once we have that idea set up, we want to practice that. And so, we wanted to, we're just going to use, do that locally in, uh, in Colorado here. So let, Brian Enke is one of our active members. So we, he lives in Netherlands. That's his house. There's Barker Reservoir and Rose coming out of Boulder Canyon and 72 heading north. We're going to do a Colorado mission, what we call a practice practice mission, <laughs> because the missions up on Death Island are actually practice missions. <laughs> the actual missions would hopefully be on Mars. So we do our practice practice missions by basically Having a bunch of crew members go to Brian's house, spend the night there, get up the next day, there were a couple of members who had geology degrees, and they kind of led them off on our EVA in Boulder Canyon to go explore the rocks and stuff. And then they would come back to Brian's, not Brian's house, the HAB, <laughs> and they would write up their reports and send them to us at Mission Control. And we would look at them and go, ooh, very good. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> So that was our practice practice missions. And one of the things we learned from that, let's go down our bullet list to lessons learned. It takes a lot longer to do that than you think. The crews were very, very busy just going out there, doing the thing, coming back, writing up the report, sending it in, and then trying to get to bed at a reasonable hour. So that was something that we kind of thought, okay, let's keep that in mind when we're pretending for real up on Devon Island, that they'll be very busy. Now, that first season, Robert Zubrin was going to be actually on the crew up there at Devon Island. He'd help, he was up there for the assembly, they get it built out, now he's on the crew for their first mission simulations. Well, at that time, he decides, hmm, I don't want the people back on Earth telling me what to do. So he said, oh, no, no, it shouldn't be called mission control. It should be called mission support. <laughs> Our job is to help him in any way that we can in what he's doing up there. Now, as it happened, there, that first uh, crew rotation, there was an issue that required a little mission support. I was working mission support at the time. They just built the hab. They're doing their first simulations. They put in their fluorescent lights, and the fluorescent lights are blinking. You've probably seen fluorescent lights do that blinking thing. Mm -hmm. Well, on the mission support, they say, hey, we've got a problem with the lights. What can we do? Well, how do I support that? Well, let me get in contact with the light bulb manufacturer. <laughs> so I got in touch with the light bulb manufacturer and said, hey, these lights that we have are blinking, flashing a lot. Why, why is that? Is there something we can do about it? And they go, really? Well, that shouldn't happen. The fluorescent lights really shouldn't be blinking. Well, you know, unless, you know, like if, if it's really cold. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and I go, you mean like north of the Arctic Circle and the Canadian Arctic? So I don't know what ever got done about that. Uh, I would imagine by now they've switched over to LED lights so they don't have that uh, flickering issue. But, okay, so now we get the mission logistics down, uh, it was kind of time for our next objective, which was the spacesuits. We wanted people to have to put on a suit to go outside so it would feel more like what you can experience in Mars. Of course, it's not really a spacesuit. It's not intended to be worn out in space. It's a Mars suit. You're supposed to wear it on Mars. So, 
we had a bunch of meetings at Pioneer Astronautics to kind of kick around ideas for what that could be like. Some people said, hey, you know, put on a jumpsuit and a motorcycle helmet. <laughs> Call it a spacesuit. That would give you a lot of the same effect. But, you know, we're working with the Discovery Channel. They're going to be videotaping this thing. We want something that looks a little better than that. We want something that looks more like this. <laughs> something that people will recognize as a spacesuit. Now, some argue that, hey, you know, in the future, by the time we get to Mars, there's some there's talk about skin-tight spacesuits. So it might well be that the, the tight jumpsuits are a more realistic thing. And like, we don't care, because we need the public to look at whatever we have and not go, what's that supposed to be? Some kind of spacesuit? We want something they will recognize right away. So, we came, came up with a list of things. <laughs> had to look like a spacesuit. We're not going to do any skin tight stuff. Had to protect our astronaut from the environment. They're going to be up in the Canadian Arctic walking around in this thing. Had to have a radio built in so they could communicate with each other and communicate with the HAB. And it had to simulate that loss of flexibility and dexterity that you have when you're wearing a spacesuit walking around. And the tactile senses that you would have, you know, working with space gloves and that sort of stuff. And, and this is kind of the challenging part, we wanted it to be inexpensive. Now, we were hoping a few hundred dollars, and at least, you know, certainly under a thousand dollars. I think in the end, and it surprises me that it's this much when you look at the things involved, that they came in at around eight hundred dollars a piece for the suits. Um, and of course, it has to survive walking around the rocky environment, our supposed Mars thing. So it had to be kind of a tough material. <clears throat> now, as it happens, we actually got a spacesuit costume from a Hollywood special effects company. We got two of these. Uh, Global Effects was the name of the company. And the spacesuits actually looked pretty good. The only drawback was they said, if you damage it, they're $10,000 a piece. <laughs> OK, we're not going to do that. But we learned an important lesson from them, which is the backpack that would normally have oxygen tanks in a real spacesuit, all they had was fans blowing outside air up into the helmet. And that's how their actors, because I believe these suits were actually used in a movie, that's how the actors could breathe fresh air. No oxygen tank, just blow fresh air. So that's what we thought. OK, we got our basic plan. Let's buy or have someone sew some kind of a polish looking jump seat thing, make a backpack with a battery fan and hoses in it, and blow that up into some kind of helmet. Then the fun began, which was going around trying to put all this stuff together. Um, so I'm spending a lot of time walking through Home Depot and uh, a container store and stuff like that, looking for things. Um, I did go to a costume shop to see what they would have, but the costumes they had tended to be kind of silly looking, like, you know, little kids would wear them for Halloween or something. But they did have one that looked pretty good. And so normally they rent that out. Uh, they said they could sell it to us for $400. We thought, that's a little high. It doesn't include the backpack or the air supply or any of that kind of stuff. So maybe not do that. So we ended up going actually with Patty Keju, who's a local custom costume designer. <laughs> custom costume designer. Um, and so what we decided on, canvas, because it looks kind of Apollo-y, um, had the right look to it. And it's sturdy when you're walking around the rocks and that sort of stuff. And she had a sewing machine that could sew a canvas. So I'm no expert on sewing machines, but apparently not all of them can do that. Um, so, we started figuring out, okay, what's that going to be like? Well, we considered a shirt and pants arrangement with maybe a metal ring or something to attach them, but then just decided it would be simpler just to have a single suit that zips up the back, which you get into. So it's kind of a Martian onesie, if you will. Um, now, for the backpack, I did my first little experiments. This is kind of taking this picture and zooming in on that backpack there. I bought this little file box. And I said, hey, that looks like those things that the astronauts carry as they walk out to the rock. So let me do that. So I stuck a fan in it where that hole is and hose coming out of it and stuck it into my old knapsack here. <laughs> Ran that out. That was basically a tested idea. Does it work? <coughs> it's like, yeah, okay, but that's 
we need looking. That's not what we're going to go with. <laughs> so um, eventually what I went with was the, an eight and a half gallon storage bin. Here's one that. Stuff on it. I put the fans uh, and battery into it. And then sat uh, patty so the cover, this is actually parts of a backpack cover, that you put over the bin so that it doesn't look like a storage bin in your bag. Um, okay, now for the backpack frame itself, I found an external frame backpack at Galleon Sporting Goods at the Flatiron's Crossing Mall before it turned into Dick's Sporting Goods. <laughs> Take the knapsack part off and just use the frame. Here's that. Now, the nice thing about this being white plastic is it has these slots in it. And that means you could run straps to connect things to the backpack frame. And so Patty sewed these straps on the side of the covers so that we could run those through the slots on the frame and now we could put that on the backpack. That meant you could easily take it off if you needed to. Uh, there, the covers have a lid on it so there's also ways of taking the box out of the cover if you need to. Um, Okay, yeah, and then I upped the fan count to two. There's a Radio Shack equipment cooling fans. Put in a seven amp hour lead acid battery held in place by some little metal tab. You know, you're walking around Home Depot. There, I can do that. <laughs> um, and so that kind of handled the backpack. The biggest challenge for us was the helmet. Um, we were looking for this kind of fishbowl helmet that Buzz is wearing there. And um, looking around trying to find something, I even considered the the ball, the pla quarter plastic balls and gumball machines that you see. But I looked at them closely, and the plastic optical quality is not very good. So there's going to be a distorted image. And I thought, okay, and that's what we need. Is our astronauts getting nauseous as they walk around the Devon Island? So uh, we looked at some toy helmets. Here's a toy helmet. Uh, here's Tony Muscatello, one of our members trying out a toy helmet to see if that would work. He's wearing a jumpsuit idea that we didn't end up going with. And the helmet's really too small, it was too dark, so that didn't really work out. The breakthrough came when Tony got an email from another member of the bar <coughs> saying, hey, Edmund Scientific sells clear plastic hemispheres for under 100 bucks. Okay, that's going to be kind of on the expensive side for our suit, but we really do need, do need uh, joint optical quality for that. In their catalogs, they show that uh, protecting security cameras and that sort of thing. And they had two sizes, which was 16 inch and 12 inch. 16 inch was going to be too big, so we went with 12 inch. Here it is now. Um, so if we could make the front out of that clear hemisphere, then we can make the back out of something else, but we can figure it out. Um, so I was back at Organized Living, <coughs> Organized Living that became the container store, which is where I got these guys from, and I saw a trash can. So here's a trash can now. <laughs> Didn't want a walking tools of you here. So, and this is actually a clue between two trash cans. But, you know, dumb top, little rotating door here. And so I thought, hey, if I cut this flange off, actual design document, <laughs> um, this flange, there was a flange here that would make it fit nicely. Cut that off, I now had a flat surface that I could bolt this to. There's my helmet. Then all I needed to do was cut off half the door fasten the other half in, and now i got a hole to stick my head through. So, that's how trash cans turned into <laughs> space helmets. Um, now, the next question is how do I attach that to the space um, So, initially I thought, well, let me just make some cardboard neck rings. You know, got a little shoulder hole cut in it. Oh, I can put padding on it. That's not going to work up in Devon Island, but we kind of get the idea of what we're looking for. What I was really looking for was two plastic cylinders that fit snugly, one inside the other, and where I could cut like a little L groove in it so you could put the helmet on, 
give it a little twist, and it would be locked into place. I couldn't find plastic cylinders big enough and that had the right size combination. So keep in mind, I'm trying to do this by going to Home Depot and Lowe's and the container store and that sort of stuff. And then walking around Home Depot, I saw this. It's a sprinkler valve cover. <laughs> so this part's supposed to go underground, the sprinkler point to go in there, and the green lid goes on the top. Here's some of that material, some of the scrap after I cut stuff off. The thing about this is it's actually slightly conical. And I first saw, oh, that's a drawback. Oh, that's a shame. It's conical. And Robert Zuber goes, no, Dixie cups. You're stacking Dixie cups. You can now fit part of the cylinder into the other part, or part of the cone into the other part of the cone. So I got what I wanted by doing that, by having plastic that would fit inside plastic nice and snug. Um, okay, so. I used a table saw, this is the result of that, to take it and cut it into pieces and drill holes and cut a little arch for the, uh, your shoulders. And there are kind of two parts to it. The part that attaches to the helmet, I call it the neck ring, and then the part that actually sits over your shoulder was the collar. I just find that because I'm going to use that phrase in a bit. Um, so initially, I put a canvas cover on the collar part so that it would blend in more nicely with the space. And it does look better like that, but that was so much work. I got to make a half a dozen of these to go up to the Arctic. So we ended up deciding it wasn't worth it, and in the end, all the colors uh, looked black. But I still have uh, the prototype, and there's one of them up in uh, Devon Island that has the, uh, the canvas. So now the question is, how? okay, I got a neck ring and a collar. How am I attaching that to the suit? And I couldn't really see a good way to attach it to the suit, but let me change the caption here. The sternum strap. There's a sternum strap on this backpack frame. So I cut a little slot in the front of the collar, run a little adjustable strap through that, now through the sternum strap, and <laughs> tighten that up. And then, see if this one's visible enough. On the back of it, I cut two slots, and I can run those straps through some of the slots that are in the backpack frame. So that gives me two points to hold it down in the back, the one to hold it down in front. So the collar system didn't attach to the suit, it attached to the backpack frame. Uh, where are we here? Um, let's see. Ah, okay. The, the neck ring fits snugly into the collar but I needed something to really hold it in place, put some clasps on it. So I put two on the front, one on the back. And one of the reasons for that is that if there's an emergency, a problem, you really need to get the helmet off quickly, you can undo the two in the front, rock the helmet back, and that would disengage the one in the back, and you've got the helmet off. You don't need somebody to help you take your helmet off. So if there's a short circuit with that battery in the backpack, for instance, you don't want to be breathing smoke. Um, So then the question is now, how do we get the air out of the storage bin up into the helmet? And so, uh, and it needs to be removable. And so, did a little shopping around and found build pump hose at Home Depot. Nice and flexible, but stiff enough that you can kind of drill, drill holes in it. And then use PVC fittings to connect things. Because I wanted the hoses, the air supply, to be disconnectable from the backpack and from the helmet. And so, this is the lid to one of the storage bins. Drill a hole in it, and this is a little threaded piece of PVC. And then you take a union, which you can buy there. This half threads onto that. That's on the helmet or on the backpack. And now this screws on. It's easier to screw on and it's attached to something. Um, and now you have a removable uh, air hose system going from the back back and up to the helmet. So I put two of those on there, one on each side. Uh, there's the union there, you can see, and there on the back back is the one from the other side. Um, initially, when I did the first testing, I just did a single hose and a single fan, and that proved the concept, but it didn't provide enough air. So we moved it up to two hoses and two fans. During my Mars missions, I actually got a phone call. I was working mission support, 
got a phone call from a guy who worked at a spacesuit company, an actual <laughs> real spacesuit company. But he had to be very careful. He couldn't be seen to be advising us in case we got ourselves into trouble. So he asked the question, does your air supply system provide X cubic feet per minute of air into the helmet? I don't know, but thanks for asking. Because now I knew it should. <laughs> so I actually hooked the hose system up to a plastic bag, let it run for 15 seconds, and got out a ruler and measured how many cubic feet of air I had. <laughs> and it said, yeah, we're pretty close. So uh, I'll go with that. Um, OK, so now. We've gotten almost all done. The next thing is footwear. What are you going to wear? Now, some thought was just, hey, wear your hiking boots. What do we care? The Discovery Channel's like, that doesn't look a lot like a spacesuit. You do that. <laughs> so we thought, okay, what are we going to do? And Zubrin went snooping around. He found some uh, uh, army surplus boots. And he thought, well, that's a, that unifies the look at least, but they're black and not white. So what we thought was, well, how about if we have Patty Cage, who sewed the the, the suits and the, the covers, make little gaiters. Now, a gaiter is something you wear, covers the bottom of your leg, and kind of goes over your shoe. So here's a picture of me and Brian Enke around Barker Reservoir testing these things out. I am wearing the white gaiters, and Brian is wearing some store-bought black gaiters that kind of go over his hiking boots. Well, it turned out we, we wasted a lot of time on this. <laughs> Making gaiters that cover the whole shoe and yet survive walking around in this kind of environment very, very hard. And so eventually we just said, to heck with it, we're just going to go with these. And the Discovery Channel said, we'd really rather see white. Tough. We're not going to do that. So anytime you see pictures of the guys up there, as a rule, they're wearing black gators that you can just buy store off to kind of give a uniform look. And it covers up most of the hiking boot. So if your hiking boot looks a little different, it's pretty much bad. Uh, okay, got to have radios. Um, working my way down the table here. For the Colorado missions, we just use these little family radio sort of walkie-talkies. And um, they don't have a long range, uh, but, they, but they're good enough. Here's a picture of me wearing, you see I just clipped it to the outside onto that sternum strap. You put on a headset, and now, because the collar is not attached to the suit, you can sneak the wire underneath the collar and get it up into the helmet that way. Fortunately, we didn't have to worry about having any airtight seals yeah. in this thing. Uh, the, they have a box circuit on them, which means it will respond to your voice. It, you don't always have to push to talk, like a regular walkie-talkie. If you're wearing the headset and the headset hears you, starts to hear you talking, it'll go ahead and push the button for you and you'll transmit it. But what we found is it was a little slow to respond. So it would clip off your first words. So what we found is it helped if you began every sentence with, uh. <laughs> so, so you might have a conversation that goes, uh, I'm going to get a sample of that rock. Uh, do you need a hammer? Uh, no, it's all enough. <laughs> um, now, on, <laughs> On Devon Island, we upgraded to UHF radios and actually put an antenna on the outside of the backpack. This is the best picture of that I could find. Here's where I attach the antennas on the thing. I really like that because I think that looks so spacey, the head of the antenna <laughs> sticking out of the back of the backpack. <laughs> uh, and then the next question now is if you're going to be walking around an EVA for hours outside, you've got to be able to drink water. Kind of spoils the I'm on Mars illusion if you're looking for having it up and taking a swim. <laughs> so, platypus bags to the rescue. If you've done much hiking, you might be familiar with these things. Fill it up with water, put it on top of the storage bin in the backpack, the cover holds it in place, run the hose around it through the helmet. So, there's the hose running around through the helmet. Platypus water bags have what's called a bite valve on them, which means the water won't leak out the end of the tube unless you bite down on the thing. So that's what this guy's doing. He's biting down on that bite valve and taking a sip. And that way it doesn't leak water all inside your, your helmet. Um, okay, that's the stuff that required thinking. We bought gloves to wear, and they made it hard to do things that required dexterity, like writing notes on a notepad, that sort of thing. So we had it all designed, and the first prototypes made, it was time to test this stuff. 
So the first test runs I made, I took one of the suits, went to Dinosaur Ridge in Morrison, along with Bob Cole, the uh, geologist. And it was kind of a cold, gray day. And what I found was my exhaled breath fogging up the inside. So this is a picture from Devon Island. Okay, <laughs> fogging up. So I'm like, okay, we got to fix that somehow. So I put in some little 90 degree air diverters. So the air blowing into the helmet would actually blow directly on the faceplate to try to keep this part from condensing up. And that helped a little right around there, but it still wasn't uh, a full solution. And then there was a meeting of the F Mars Committee. So that's Lucky Mucks in the Mars Society who make the decisions about this sort of stuff. And we were talking about this, and a guy named Chris McKay, some of you may be familiar with him, uh, he was on the committee and he said, hey, liquid soap, smear that around on the inside and it won't fog up. So that was going to be our solution. Put in the diverters, liquid soap on the thing, and hopefully it wouldn't fog up. I don't actually know how well that worked out. Um, if you watch the Discovery Channel show from that first season, there's a lot of people with their helmets completely fogged up. But that may have been before we had our meetings and worked out our solutions for that. So I don't know how things uh, fared in the end. But, uh, by the way, these little hard plastic air diverters, really handy if your nose is just. <laughs> but, you know, you're so used to just being able to scratch your nose around here. You got a helmet on, there's no finger access. So it's kind of nice to have these little air diverters and kind of do that sort of thing. There's something itched. Okay, so now we, uh, Brian Enke and I uh, did a Colorado mission looking out of his house. This is at Barker Reservoir. The water levels were low, so it made our good Mars analog environment. We walked around testing that out. Um, one of the things we came upon when doing that was some people were out there and they had an ATV, all-terrain vehicle. Now the plan at the Devon Island was that's how the astronauts would get around, a little one-seater ATVs not doing a two-seat moon buggy like they did in Apollo. So, hey, this would be a good opportunity to find out, is there a problem wearing the spacesuit sitting on the ATV? And so there I am trying it out, and go, hey, no problem, good. We're in good shape. Um, so with the test successful, it was time for me to make seven of those things and ship up to uh, Devon Island. And Patty K2 sewed, a bunch of uh, different dump suits of different sizes for the different size people who might wear them. And now we're ready to begin doing the, uh, the simulation mission it's kind of in earnest with full set of, of suits up there. Um, I'm really quite pleased with how it came out as far as looking kind of Apollo-ish. And I'm particularly pleased with how often they show up in the publicity shots and magazine article shots and newspaper shots of what's going on at Dev and I, the F Mars stuff. They always seem to want to get somebody in one of these spaces. So I think that's kind of cool. Um, the, as a postscript to this, so that's sort of the, the main pitch. A little postscript, 2003 Robert Zubin wrote an account of the whole F Mars adventure up there. So if you found that an interesting story, you can really get the details by looking at that book. Um, and the Mars Society did not stop with F Mars. They made another one in Utah called the Mars Desert Research Station. And this was kind of cool. After it was constructed, I think, in Arizona. And after they built it, it was shipped to the Kennedy Space Center where it went on display at the visitor center there. <laughs> so people would go into the KSC and go, oh look, hey, you know, this might be a Mars habitat someday, kind of thing. And they could go kind of toward the inside. So it was there for a couple of months, and then got shipped here to Hanksville, uh, Utah, near Hanksville, out in the Utah desert. The missions there are run during the late fall, winter, and early spring, when it's cool enough to be in a, uh, the Utah desert without air conditioning. Um, the logistics of sending people and equipment to Utah, <coughs> rather than Devon Island up in Canada, way easier. <laughs> so there have been a lot of missions run there, usually one to two week missions. People from all, there have been 200, over 200 crews have done one to two week missions there. So it's been getting a lot of uh, use. And as you can see, it's kind of been expanded. 
there and added some greenhouse to it. And that is a little observatory with a 14-inch telescope in it, donated by Elon Musk. So that's the Musk observatory there. And it's remote control from inside the hat. And yes, the skies in that part of Utah are really, really good. Um, and of course, for me, that means make another half dozen helmets and backpacks and tag and sewing more suits for those guys. Then in uh, 2002, I think it was, um, the European section of the Mars Society said, hey, we want to get in on this too. So they funded the construction of Euromars, which was uh, to go in Iceland. And it's a slightly different design. You can see it's made out of metal instead of fiberglass. It was built in Denver, so I got to work on that as well. And uh, the design changed a little. There's going to be three floors, and the top floor was going to be a fairly narrow floor, but that was where the sleeping quarters was, because you wouldn't need a lot of uh, you know, ceiling space for your sleeping quarters. And that meant that you had a little more room in the rest of the thing. Um, when that was finished, that got shipped to Chicago, where it went on display at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. So we're getting some good press out of this thing, if nothing else. Um, but after that, I'm not sure what happened. Uh, I think it, you know, the Europeans collected it, it went to Europe, I heard that it got damaged, something, they never set it up. So I don't know what ever happened with that thing. Uh, if you ever want to see Robert Zubin get angry, just ask him about it. <laughs> um, and then, of course, there's the Mars Society, which is still going strong. And uh, the, their website, Mars Society is a dot org. They have an annual convention every year. It takes place in different places in essentially North America. It's been in Toronto. This year it's going to be at USC in LA. Uh, it has been in Boulder a number of times. And they have a uh, university rover challenge, which is where university students build these little rovers, remote control rovers kind of thing, and they have a competition. And this year's winners were from Poland. So just to give you a sense of how international uh, the Mars Society is. Now, my own involvement really got dialed back after doing all the spacesuit stuff. Uh, there's still a Rocky Mountain Mars Society chapter that has monthly meetings. We don't meet down at Pioneer Astronautics anymore. We used to meet on the CU campus. <coughs> in the nice weather, we would meet at the Gordon Biersch Brew Pub at the Flatirons Crossing Mall. <laughs> and, you know, we're down to like half a dozen to a dozen people who just sit around talking about space things. When we'd meet on campus, Brian Hickey would sometimes arrange for a speaker to come, but not very often. It's usually just conversation and stuff. We have lost our site on CU campus because they've done some construction. So the room that we're going to do is no longer available. So I don't actually know where we're going to be from October to November when we have our meetings. For all I know, we'll be inside at the Gordon Hirsch uh, Room Club. <laughs> Um, Bob Zubrin pretty much never attends the Rocky Mountain Mars Society uh, chapter meetings. Um, so, okay, that's kind of it. I will take some questions. We'll do the group photo. Everybody standing behind the table so <laughs> in the foreground. And then if you want, you can try on the helmet. That's the, one of the real helmets, not the toy helmet. Uh, which goes with this backpack. I got another backpack frame over here. Bob Cole made this one. It's much heavier than the originals. He was trying a system that also had an air hose that connected to the suit. So you can just look at this stuff if you want to and try on the suits and helmets. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? How much did it cost? The suit? No, the, the project. The, you know, it's not, we, the Marines donated, but I don't know. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know. My guess is hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. It wasn't millions. I do know that Bob Zubrin went to talk to uh, Elon Musk and other people in California at some time before everyone knew Elon Musk. And Elon basically said, hey, this business of, you know, hundred thousand dollars, a couple hundred thousand dollars for these habitats, that's all fine and good, but what would you do if you had like 10 million? Right. <laughs> and, and, and he's basically saying, because I know the people who could put together $10 million. And Zubrin actually came up with what I thought <clears throat> was a genius idea. I don't know if he had thought of it before, came up with it on the spur of the moment. But what he wanted to do 
was send mice into space, maybe up to the space station, in a rotating habitat that provided Martian gravity. Because we don't, you know, we know what happens when you're weightless. We know what happens when you're on Earth gravity. We don't have any data on what happens if you live a long time in Martian gravity. And so his idea was, let's send up pregnant mice. And they will give birth to their little mices up there, and we'll see them grow and go through their thing. It turns out there comes a limit to that, because kind of like with humans, once the male mice hit puberty, they get a little rambunctious. And so at that point, you bring the mice back down, and you basically do biopsies on the wall and see how it affected their bone growth and that sort of stuff. And that seemed like something that could actually be done in the $10 million range. Um, the Mars Society kind of took it on, and then that project kind of got spread out amongst some universities, MIT was involved, and then I kind of never heard of it again. So, I don't know. Bless you. They didn't need to do a C-130 drop in Utah. So, <laughs> they didn't need to do a C-130 yeah, right. drop in yeah. Utah. Yeah, they did drive in, there were trucks. <laughs> yeah. And these four would have to be inside the backpack on your back because it's going to freeze. That's what I thought, too. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about up in the... The, the water supply. Oh, the, the water. Right. Yeah. You're putting, you're putting the water on top of the thing? It's going to freeze. Well, actually, it turns out that during, you know, Devon Island, being where it is, they don't run missions except during the Devon Island summer, yeah. when the sun is up. So it's not that bad, cold-wise. <laughs> Because you're right, that would, present, that would present a problem. I have heard of them talking about trying to put together the funding for a one-year stay, which north of the Arctic Circle means going through Arctic night up there. I do not want to be on that mission. Um, and you know, they, 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 they sort of have problems with their water freezing at that point. Everything. So, oh, yeah, it was really good. Crack. Yeah. So, was it just two months of the year that be mm -hmm. I don't know how long the season was. I think it was more than two months, but it wasn't huge. And, of course, at NDRS, the season gets cut because you don't want to be there during the season. Mm -hmm. so. Anything else? Very Let's put away chairs. Thank you.